Today in the Physics Funhouse, we are investigating circular motion. In AP Physics 1, we are only going to stick to circular motion at a constant speed, which we refer to as uniform circular motion. Now don't get too clever and try to replace the word speed there with the word velocity. It's very important that we understand the difference between the two. The speed of this thing is relatively constant. Its velocity, however, is constantly changing. The thing we need to remember is that velocity includes both a magnitude and a direction. And so what's changing in circular motion is the direction that the object is moving. And so with this little rubber stopper that I'm swinging around, it's constantly changing direction. At one minute it's moving up, right here. The next instance it's moving sideways, like over here. And then when it's at the bottom most point of its arc, it's moving like this direction, to my left, your right. And so the motion of this thing is constantly changing. So this thing is constantly accelerating because its velocity is changing because its direction is changing. And so in order for something to be accelerating, we need to remember that that means that there has to be a force. And the best way to visualize forces and understand their directions is to stick with things with strings. And so if you look carefully, as I swing this thing in a circle, the direction that the string is pulling, the rubber stopper, is always towards my hand, namely where I'm pinching the string between my thumb and my pointer finger. And so if I were to remove that force and let go of the string, it doesn't move in a circle anymore. And so in order to have something moving in uniform circular motion or any circular motion, um, even if it's changing speed, we have to have a force because forces are what cause accelerations, and it has to be directed towards the center of the circle. And so when this force is directed towards the center of the circle, namely my hand in this demonstration, then the rubber stopper moves in a circle. If I let go of it, it stops moving in a circle. A few more demos coming up here in just a second. Now, I wanna introduce a new vocabulary term to you, but it's very important that we start right away using this term correctly. And that is the term centripetal. Centripetal is an adjective. Adjective is a describing word, like green and red, for example. Centripetal refers to the direction of a specific force, namely towards the center of the circle. And so as I swing this thing in a circle with a string, the tension force is what's making the rubber stopper move in a circle. The tension force in this instance is centripetal meaning it is directed towards the center of the circle. Kind of like saying a car is blue or a shirt is red. And so if you're ever confused how to use the word centripetal, if you're using it in a place where you can substitute something like a color and the sentence would still make sense, then you are using the word centripetal correctly. So we can further investigate how the force and velocity on something moving in a circle are related to each other by having an easy way to remove the force and observe the resulting motion. And so I've got a simple ball bearing we we'll put inside this clear cylinder. And then when I spin the cylinder around, the ball bearing moves in a circle. The friction kind of slows it down pretty quickly after a while. But to the first approximation, after I get done speeding that thing up, the ball bearing will move in uniform circular motion. So observe what happens when I speed it up, get it moving in circular motion, and then remove the thing that is keeping it moving in a circle. You notice that after I removed the force keeping it in a circle, which is the normal force, provided by my little clear cylinder, the ball bearing kept moving at a constant velocity in a straight line, just like things with no forces acting on them tend to do. Let's try another one. And so at any point along the motion in a circle, the velocity of the object is tangent to that circle. And so if I remove the force keeping it moving in a circle, it will not continue moving in a circle, but move in a straight line. So notice that if I want the ball bearing to be moving to the right, 
when I lift up the cylinder, I can't wait for the ball bearing to be over here on the right side of the circle. If I move, or if I lift the container when it's at the right side of its circle, it comes towards me. If I want the ball bearing to move to the right, then I need to lift the cylinder when the ball bearing is right here because this is the point when it's moving tangent to the circle and tangent to the cylinder at this point would be to the right. A turntable is a good way to experience things moving in uniform circular motion because they spin at constant rates. Spinning is not uniform circular motion. The turntable itself is not moving in a circle around something that is exterior to itself. The turntable is rotating. However, the penny on the turntable is revolving. It is moving around something that is exterior to it, namely that little silver peg in the center of the turntable. So the penny is moving in uniform circular motion. And we could figure out how fast the penny is moving in a couple of different ways. One, we could figure out how long it takes to make one revolution. We could use a stopwatch to do that. Number two, we could figure out its velocity by figuring how far it moves in a given time period. So let's grab some tools and see if we can investigate both of those different ways of describing its motion. So there are two simple ways to describe the rate at which that penny is moving around on the turntable. The first is just to measure its period, which is the time for one revolution. So for that, we're going to need a stopwatch tool. Now, it's really difficult to time exactly one revolution. So the trick is, is you mark a point, like where my arrow is, and you time 10 or possibly more revolutions, and then just divide by the number of revolutions you time. So we're gonna shoot for 10, since that's an easy thing to divide by. So we're gonna wait for it to be lined up with that arrow and press start. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so I get 13.22 seconds for 10 revolutions. And so dividing that by 10 means one revolution took 1.3 seconds. And that's about as precise as I feel like getting here. So the period of revolution is 1.3 seconds. The frequency is just the inverse of that. So if one revolution takes 1.3 seconds, the question is how many revolutions are there in one second? And so if I divide one by 1.3, that would give me the frequency, I'm gonna reduce that to a decimal, 0.78 revolutions per second would be the frequency. Um, frequency is often expressed using the unit hertz, which is just thing per second, the frequency of revolution for my penny is 0.78 hertz. And so you may have heard the term hertz used with radio waves, for example. Um, you may have heard it used with spin rates for hard drives, like in a computer, um, or memory in a computer. And so whenever you see the term hertz, that's referring to a frequency, which is just things per second. Another unit of frequency you may be familiar with would be RPMs, or revolutions per minute or rotations per minute, um, which is a typical way of describing how fast a car engine spins. So next, we might also be interested in how fast that penny is moving linearly or tangentially. So the other way of describing the speed of that penny is just in terms of its velocity, kind of like we've always done in physics. Remember that velocity is displacement over time. Well, I can't precisely measure the displacement because it's not moving in a straight line, but I can measure the length of the path that it follows. So really I can get its speed by measuring the circumference and dividing that by the period. That's the easiest way to kind of do this. And to get circumference, I can do two pi times the radius to do that. Measuring the radius from the center of the silver peg at the middle of the turntable to, I'm going to go to the middle of the penny, that is 10.5 centimeters. So if I do 2 pi, radius of 10.5 centimeters over a period of 1.3 seconds, that gives me a speed of... 
50.7 centimeters per second. And if you like, you can convert that to meters per second. So that penny isn't exactly screaming as it moves around that turntable. So what you'll notice is that as the radius changes, so does the velocity. So let's use some arrows to relate the direction of both the force and the velocity. The velocity is always tangent to the circle. And so just putting that arrow tangent to the grooves on my um, turntable, that arrow represents the direction of the velocity at any given moment. This arrow is going to represent the direction of the force, which always has to be towards the center of the circle. And so when I start the turntable, what you'll notice is that those arrows are always going to be perpendicular to each other. The force is always pointing inward. The velocity is always pointing tangent to the circle. So since the velocity of the penny depends on how far out it is from the center, it's very easy for a penny to sit on the center of a turntable. It doesn't require very much friction to turn a penny at a low speed. But if I put a penny further out on the turntable, this penny does not stay on the turntable as well. That penny is moving very fast compared to this penny. And if I get it too close to the edge, friction is just not big enough to keep it moving in a circle. So remember that the force that is causing the penny to turn is static friction, and static friction can only be so big. And having the edge of the penny right at the edge of the turntable is about as far away from the center as I can get the penny. If I try to move it further out, there's simply not enough static friction to cause it to turn, and so the penny speeds up and then it continues moving in a straight line. So with the penny out here on the edge, it's going to speed up when I let go of the turntable and eventually reach a velocity that would require a greater static friction force than the turntable is able to provide. So when the centripetal force required to turn this penny in a circle exceeds the maximum static friction force, the penny will no longer move in a circle and instead go flying off in a straight line. So we've seen now that the velocity of something moving in uniform circular motion is always tangent to the circle. The force is always inward from that same point. And so what we can conclude from that is the velocity and the force are perpendicular to each other at any point along the motion of something moving in uniform circular motion. And so if the motion is uniform circular motion, we can make the claim that that force does not do any work. Because remember, work is only done when the force and the displacement are parallel to each other. And so we can claim that the force causing this thing to turn is only changing its direction, not its energy as it turns. So let's do a more careful investigation of the things that affect the centripetal acceleration of an object. So earlier I was string swinging this rubber stopper on the end of a string, you know, just kind of casually like this. Um, what I'm going to do now is do this a little bit more carefully. And so you'll notice that the rubber stopper is attached to a string that passes through this tube. And the other end of the string, I've got a paper clip. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang a mass on the other paper clip. And I'm going to swing this thing in such a way that, right, carefully, the mass on the end of the string is in equilibrium. So I'm not actually holding the string with my hands. I'm just holding it by the tube, and all that the tube does is redirect the string. And so the string is going up and down as it exits the bottom of the tube, but it's going inward at the top of the tube. And then there's a little blue mark on the string so that I can keep the radius constant. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to swing this thing at a constant rate such that the mass at the bottom is in equilibrium. And that little blue mark on the string will help me do that. And so as I do that, you can kind of hear and see how fast the rubber stopper is going. So it says the tension in the string is, let's well, making it move in a circle. Um, I know what the tension in the string is right now because I know what this mass is. So it'll be 0.5 newtons. And so that was the speed 
of a rubber stopper with a tension force, or in this case, the tension is centripetal, of about 0.5 newtons. Now, let's make that force larger. The way I'm going to do that is replace the 50 gram mass with a 200 gram mass. And if you have calibrated masses, you can do this um, relatively precisely. But even if you don't, if you have two like different mass things you can hang on the end of a string, you can at least feel the difference in a small tension versus a large tension. So now I've got a larger tension. And so let's see, ooh, saved you first. Let's see how the speed at which the rubber stopper has to move in order to keep the 200 gram mass in equilibrium changes in this case. Let's see. So notice that now I've got to swing this thing a lot faster. Get the radius down where it's supposed to be. There we go. I gotta swing this thing a lot faster with more force causing it to turn. So what this shows us is that the more quickly an object turns, the greater its speed, in other words, the greater its acceleration. And so the equation that relates the acceleration, velocity, and the radius of the turn looks something like this. And you can find the derivation in your textbook, a lot of geometry. Um, but hopefully we can see that in order to get the thing to turn faster, it's got to have a higher acceleration, which requires a higher force. Because we can still relate force, mass, and acceleration using Newton's second law.